Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to White Bear Unitarian Universalist Church. We are delighted to have you here, both those in this space and those attending virtually. It is good to be together, a community of youth, adults, and children sharing the values of courage, reverence, and compassion. I'm Jillian Lampert, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a member of our board of directors. Leading this service uh, with me today is our worship associate, Lisa Sem, and our preacher, Nico Van Ostrand. Many of you know Nico as our assistant director of religious education here at WBUUC. They grew up in this congregation and are now in seminary at United Theological School. We are so proud to support Nico on their journey to becoming a minister. Recently, the board sponsored them on their path to ordination. Please join me in welcoming Nico. can hear you clapping at home. If you have a request for today's meditation, please place it in the prayer bowl or in the Zoom chat box. If you're new today, welcome. Please fill out a guest card. You can find one at the Welcome Center just outside the door or in the chat box if you're online. And please be sure to sign up to be part of our e-news mailing list. That's where you'll learn about everything happening here at WBUC. On Wednesday, September 6th, 5 30 to 7 30 p.m any and all adults are invited to a choir invitational <laughs> sounds fun doesn't it the choir will share a light meal in the social hall and then sing in the sanctuary and child care will be provided no experience music reading skills or commitment necessary come check it out see the e-news announcement to fill out the sign up form current choir members you still need to rsvp and reach out to Becky Ponch, Jody McCormick, or Olivia Dierks with any questions. Thanks to our, only, our very own Virginia Podobinski, Mary Duncan, Lisa Borg, Brett Smith, and Jody McCormick for adding beauty and color today's, to today's service with your musical offerings. We thank you for sharing your many, many talents with us. Welcome to our church. Together, we grow our souls and serve the world in love. Come in, come into this place which we make holy by our presence. Come in with all your vulnerabilities and strengths, fears and anxieties, loves and hopes. For here you need not hide nor pretend nor be anything other than who you are and who you are called to be. Come into this place where we can touch and be touched, heal and be healed, forgive and be forgiven. Come into this place where the ordinary is sanctified, the human is celebrated, the compassionate is expected. Come into this place, together we make it a holy place. I'm Nico and my pronouns are they them. Good morning. I'm Lisa Sem, and my pronoun, pronouns are she, her. In preparing for today's chalice lighting, I did a lot of reading. I also spent quite a bit of time staring into my garden because I was having a hard time shrugging off the work week. I reviewed and pondered the eighth principle that we voted to adopt as a congregation this summer in June. I read through all of the FAQs about what it is who wrote it and why we need it. We need it. 
I revisited the relational covenant that our church adopted in June of 2022, a covenant that calls us to hold ourselves and each other accountable, to speak and act with one another in a way that reflects our commitment to grow our souls and serve the world in love. I googled beloved community, practical steps to get there. That was a hard one. <laughs> I googled stories of kindness. There are a lot of them. It's actually pretty amazing. I also dug deep into my own cache of memories, reflecting on the many times that I received a random kindness, a word of acknowledgement for something I did at work, a cup of coffee from a stranger at Dunn Brothers, an unexpected thinking of you text message or email. I also made a list of the times when I made an effort to step outside of myself to be kind to people I love, people I struggle to connect with, and people I don't even know. I was surprised at how many ended up on the list. It was kind of a nice exercise. I also found many poems about kindness but many of them were less helpful than I'd hoped, too sweet and lacking in practical application. Because being kind, showing kindness, and even receiving kindness can be hard. And then I found this poem by Naomi Shihab Nye, and this really rung true for me at this moment. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things, feel the future dissolve in a moment like a salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride thinking the bus will never stop the passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the roadside. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak it, speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore, only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to mail letters and purchase bread, and only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere like a shadow or a friend. Choosing kindness isn't always easy, but imagine what our experience would be if we looked into the eyes of other people and saw human. What if we tried to be kind every day? I'm Reverend Jessica Clay, and my pronouns are she, her. Will you join us in our opening words? Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Will you rise in body or spirit for our opening hymn, Break Not the Circle from the Gray Hymnal, number 323.
Good morning. My name is Amy and my pronouns are she, her. So this is part of the service where we generally share a story with you all. And one of the reasons we share stories regularly is because we recognize that something shifts within us between the start of the story and its ending. Community is kind of like this too. When we gather, when we come in together, we are holding what we are holding, each of us. We travel with it often together, and then we leave here shifted by one another and often have a brand new thought or idea or feeling to take with us when we depart. This kind of reminds me of a labyrinth practice. A labyrinth is a twisty, spirally path that you can trace with your finger or you can walk. It looks kind of like a maze, but in a labyrinth, there are no long term turns, so there's no getting lost. You simply follow the path until you reach the center and then you turn and follow the path out back once more. And so instead of a story this morning, we're all going to do a labyrinth practice together. And I hope you'll join us in the social hall after the service where there's more labyrinths to explore together. So take a moment, take a breath, and just notice where you are right now. Notice your physical location, what it looks like, what it sounds like, what it feels like. And notice your emotional location. How are you feeling right now? And where in your body are you holding that feeling? Mindful of where you are physically and emotionally, I invite you to participate in this practice in a couple of different ways, in a way that feels comfortable for you. The first option is to stay right where you are and to trace something, perhaps your finger or your hand, or a shape on your leg or on your chair, or the rectangle of a hymnal. There's also some finger labyrinths back in the Soul Work Center. The, section, the second option is to physically move through the space that you are in. You're welcome to travel the edge of the room or zigzag a pattern across the floor. You might wander up and down the aisles of the sanctuary. Whichever you choose, be aware of your, pre of your presence, where you are physically and emotionally, and what you carry with you today. We're going to begin this practice now with a little music for just a couple minutes, and then I'll call you back.
And with a breath, it's time now to exit your labyrinth. <clears throat> Finish tracing and return to the place where you started from, a little shifted from the person you were before. As you settle back into your seat, take a moment to notice your surroundings once more. Notice your physical location, your emotional location, what you're holding inside. I invite you to hold on to this noticing this morning and keep noticing when you experience something new today, be it a story, a labyrinth, a worship service, a small group, whatever it is that leaves you feeling changed today. With that invitation in mind, we're going to invite our children, youth, and, uh, and facilitators to cross a new threshold into our small circle this morning. I invite you to rise in body or spirit to sing number 1057 in the teal hymnal as we sing them on their way. So lift it up. <laughs> Hunger is everywhere, including among college students. Century College, one of the largest and most diverse two-year community colleges in Minnesota, has been recognized as a hunger-free campus. Our congregation supports that effort each school year by providing lunches for qualifying students. One day each week, as we have for many years, volunteers make and deliver sandwiches, fruit, and granola bars to help fuel students through their day. September puts us back in action making sandwiches. Today's collection will provide supplies for these lunches. Also, please consider volunteering with the Sandwich Squad on Monday afternoons from 1 to 2 p.m. Cynthia Thomason's contact information is in the chat box or available on Breeze. Please contact Cynthia to volunteer. We will pass the donation plates now. You can donate in three other ways on the WBUUC website, you can send a check or leave a check in the locked box right outside the office, or you can use the text to give option found in your order of service or in the chat box. Whichever way you give, please indicate the keyword CS. Thank you for your generosity and faith in this life we lead, we lead together serving the world.
Thank you for that beautiful gift. We gather here this morning with all of the meditations on our hearts. All of the prayers that we bring to this space, the sorrows, the joys. We come here with full lives. We come here with full hearts. And so now we make space to feel into our hearts to hold what might be hurting tenderly, to hold each other tenderly. So I invite you to cast your eyes down or close them as we breathe into this space. This morning, we hold in our hearts Lori Gordon. Lori's brother, Dan Powell, died on August 11th. He had Alzheimer's and he was 73. This morning, we hold in our hearts all of the victims and survivors of mass gun violence. For every time we read the news of another mass shooting, we pray that we continue to work towards a world with gun control, a world where this isn't our reality. This morning, we continue to pray for the people of Maui as they begin the process of rebuilding, as their lives are forever changed. And this morning, as it felt like there might be a hint of the turn of the seasons in the morning, we lift up what that means for our hearts, for our souls. We lift up what this change in season means for our, the ways that we move in our lives, the ways we orient our spirits. And now we make space to name who is on our hearts this morning. May we hold tenderly all of these names that are on our hearts all of these people we are connected to, these beloveds, may they feel our circle of care around them as they move about their days. We will now have about a moment, a minute of silence. So I invite you to continue to keep your eyes closed or cast them down before our ending meditation reading.
A Letter to Our Better Angels by Reverend Sean Parker Dennison. Dear angels, it seems important to begin by making it clear that we are not talking about celestial winged beings. This letter is addressed instead to our better selves, the people we hope we will be when necessary. We might also note that we more often excel at our self-appointed role as advocate for the devil, a requisite position that is also, if you ask us, not literal, but theoretical, and therefore without consequence. We are writing to let you know that we feel your presence insufficient and unpredictable. And when we inquire about how to make you more dependable, we are offended by and opposed to the level of accountability required. We are hoping to make arrangements for an increase in the percentage of goodness and the presence of admirable qualities in ourselves and in others, especially in others. <laughs> we respectfully request that this come easily and with immediate delivery, a dependable warranty and at no extra cost. We would be even more pleased if it could be arranged for us to become better people without needing to change or to consider any needs but our own. <laughs> it would also please us if our status as increasingly good could be noted in some way. <laughs> Perhaps a cookie, <laughs> a badge, a halo, so long as it's comfortable. We hope you will consider our request as soon as humanly possible, not in angel time. We have already waited a long time. Unaware of the seriousness of the situation, the disrepair to our reputation, please expedite our request. We have only just noticed that the world is ending. Sincerely, me. Our second reading is Trying to Talk About Flying Without Clichés by Xi Chuan, translated by Lucas Klein. Every time I think about flying, my body feels heavy. Every time I try to take off, I soar no higher than five feet, then fall to the ground, revealing my true self. One time I reached nine feet, my heart lifting to the boundless, but bruised my ass when I crashed down and my ass cursed my heart. One night I dreamt of floating from treetop to rooftop and from rooftop ascending upward half moon at my left hand, bathing in the eternal shine of the stars, entering darkness to meet no one. And then back to bed in solitude. When I went to the bathroom and flushed the toilet, Thinking back the next day without the echo of a sound, walking down the street, a boy called me grandpa. What's your name, grandson, I asked. My name is Flight, he said. I hear you, I see you, here I am happy, here I am safe. 
Just a few weeks ago, this congregation adopted the eighth principle, adding it to our shared covenant, our UU statement about how we promise to show up in the world. It reads, we, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. I am proud to be part of a congregation that has now officially adopted this principle. There are a lot of rich concepts to unpack in it, and today I want to focus in on one term, the beloved community. This term gets thrown around a lot when you use talk about justice. It was popularized by Martin Luther King Jr., who used the term to describe a world of love and justice, where people care about one another so much that things like poverty or discrimination simply cannot exist. Conflicts may still happen, but they are dealt with peacefully and from a starting point of mutual care. Heaven on earth might be another phrase to describe this, and to me it sounds like exactly what we are trying to do when we covenant together. It's a very earthly, very here and now concept that I hope you can latch onto whether or not Martin Luther King's Christian framework resonates with you. One other important thing to note here is that there are not multiple beloved communities with those people existing outside of it and us people existing inside of it or vice versa. There's only the beloved community, which imagines every single person as included. It's a pretty universalist thing to conceptualize a heaven on earth that has room for everyone. I meet with the spiritual director every month to try to untangle my questions and thoughts about the sacred, which as you might imagine have been undergoing quite an intense deepening process during seminary. At our most recent meeting, my spiritual director asked me if I had ever had a glimpse of what the beloved community might be like. I said yes, and she asked me to describe it, and I really, really tried. But my sense of it is so felt and so embodied and in my spirit that words really aren't enough to describe it. I'm reminded of one time when one of my professors opened class by throwing us into breakout rooms and telling us to come back in 15 minutes with a one sentence description of the ineffable, whose dictionary definition is something that's too great to be expressed or described in words. <laughs> it's seminary in a nutshell. So I can't really describe to you what the glimpse of what beloved community might be like, but I can kind of dance around it and trust you to fill in the blanks with your own imagination. The beloved community to me feels like coming to the top of a hill on a morning hike and watching the sun touch the plants, a breeze on your face, the sounds of birds and bugs going about their day, the realization that you are simultaneously a visitor to and fully part of the lives around you. It is the moment of sharing food when the youngest ones step back to allow elders to fill their plates first, only for one of the titas, a respected matriarch, to tell the youth to start. A moment of mutual care that names without words the respect between youth and elders in both directions. Food is sustenance for more than just the body. The beloved community is a child moving joyfully through a space, greeted and cared for by everyone present. Her parents don't worry about her because they know and trust every community member. And she understands that that group of people is an extension of her family, people that she can trust and rely on. It is even an argument about something that doesn't really matter or something that really, really does, that begins and ends with a sense of connection between all parties even if they decide not to interact with one another anymore. It is knowing that challenge is part of being human and we do not have to think or be the same to be beloved. The beloved community makes me feel whole and at home. I can be, I can express my needs and be helped in meeting them. I can speak my truths using the words spilling from my heart. I can laugh and eat and disagree and be together or alone and trust the strength of the people around me to hold us through whatever comes our way. The glimpses of what the beloved community might be like are life-giving and sustaining. And this brings me to something that I've been wrestling with for a long time. 
What I imagine the beloved community will feel like is so good. I want us to feel like that all the time, and I dare say we deserve to. So the idea that justice work is only for some future generation to enjoy, that the arc of the moral universe is so long we cannot hope to enjoy it, that hurts. It weighs on me to think that every relationship I build rests on an implied understanding that the world is too messed up and we are not good enough to move in covenant with each other and with all others. It's not fair to ask any of us to wait for justice. I want better for us. Well, you might be thinking to yourself, well, sure, we all want a just world, but the world is really broken. So it's only realistic to move the needle or bend the arc as much as we can, small though it may be. Well, maybe. I do want to stay realistic about the monumental task at hand. I hold several identities that don't allow me to be in denial about the state of the world. And even if the healing needed was a reasonable amount, which arguably maybe it's not, we humans have a knack of getting in our own way. We have a tendency to either take our hands off completely because the problem is simply too great or to fall into a sense of panic or guilt fueled urgency that can end up burning us out and ultimately have the same effect. And then there's that feeling of disappointment that Xi Chuan describes trying to fly only to fall so hard you curse yourself for dreaming it was possible in the first place. It's all too familiar to many of us as justice efforts are met with resistance or are suddenly overturned down the road. The fall is hard and the bruise is deep and it's not a good feeling, certainly not one that incentivizes us to try again. But the alternative to give up hope, to never attempt flight for fear of falling, I think would make my heart curse the world, and that is not something I am willing to do. Giving up on humanity, believing that we can't live up to our collective potential, damages our relationships and our spirits. This consideration of our spirits is what makes us distinct from a social justice nonprofit, for example. We are a UU church. We are concerned with justice, and spirituality. Grow your soul and serve the world. And so in addition to all of the important practical questions facing anyone working on social justice about direct action and policy change and shifting mindsets or lifestyles, alongside these is the question of spirit. So at the core of my dissatisfaction with thinking of justice as a realistic goal only for some far off generation is the spiritual question. What does it do to my spirit and to yours and to that which is between and greater than us when we say to one another, we will not live to experience the beloved community? I think our spirits are damaged by that statement. And whatever your concept of the greater or connecting force, I imagine it is damaged by our acceptance of any level of injustice too. So assuming that none of us wants to damage our or anyone else's spirits and assuming we're all pretty on board with the whole no more injustice thing, an alternative question arises. What if we internalize with everything we've got the idea that the beloved community can and should and will happen in our lifetime? What if we are the future people our ancestors bent the ark for? Sit with that for a moment. Set aside your doubts or your concerns about whether it's practical or not, and just dream about it with me for a moment. Imagine how much your life would be transformed if everyone were living as if the beloved community was real right now. Well, we know this is not currently the case, the reality, and though beloved community includes everyone on earth, I am not asking you yourself to take responsibility for making every single person get on board. Rather, I am asking us each to stop thinking so little of ourselves, to start believing that we can be our better angels, our better selves, the people we hope we will be when necessary, as Sean Parker Dennison writes, and to lean on each other always, but especially when we don't think we can do it. So imagine the ways you would approach each person, each decision, if you really believed 
that the beloved community was possible right now. Imagine how that would touch everyone you interacted with, how it would completely change every community, including this one. This is how, despite the state of the world and the disappointments that often come with social justice work, I know that I will get to experience the beloved community because it is the very act of living as if the beloved community were possible tomorrow that will make it so. Okay, so our deadline is tomorrow. Are you all ready? <laughs> you could make an argument that there is an urgent, this is an urgent call, that there is indeed no time to waste in living into beloved community, but urgent isn't actually the word I would use to describe our situation. Urgency drawing from Tema Open sacrifices inclusivity and relationships in favor of a short timeline. People just wouldn't function in that way in the beloved community. Rather, I think the transformation into the beloved community is imminent. It is ready to happen. The seeds of it are already germinating in each of our hearts. And here, perhaps, I am making a claim about the fundamental nature of humanity, but I don't think I'm wrong. That within each of us is everything we need to bring about the beloved community. We can do this. And even if, when all is said and done, the world isn't the way we hoped it would be, the spiritual practice of living as if, of living into the beloved community with abandon is just as important as the end goal, because it is the only way that goal can even be possible. Although it's included in the name itself, it's worth naming that the beloved community is a collaborative effort. You're not in this alone. We are supposed to lean on each other in this. The beloved community is simply incompatible with individualism. There is no way to live into it that does not count on our relationships to others. And that's why places like this church exist, to be a container in which people can connect and move towards wholeness to grow our souls and serve the world in love. So to recap, I believe with every fiber of my being that the beloved community is possible in our lifetimes, that this is a spiritual choice grounded in our principles. I believe we are up for the task. So what exactly is the task? I can't really give you the answer to that question. No one person can. It will need to come from community, but I'll lift up a few threads to get us started. First, we know that things like poverty and discrimination cannot exist in the beloved communities. Sorry, community. There are so many ways, both within this congregation and beyond, to get involved in anti-oppression efforts. And along these lines, when we adopted the eighth principle, that was just step one. Our principles are only powerful when they're lived out. Every one of us can be part of incorporating this into the life of the church, whether through individual conversations at social hour or as part of a committee or team. And if you're excited about this, let us know. There's probably more than one other community member we could connect you with. We know that the beloved community centers relationships and inclusion over urgency. This could mean treating how are you today as a genuine question rather than something to get out of the way before turning to the agenda or pausing when you notice a sense of urgency rising in yourself to ask whether your stress is trying to prioritize relationship or timeline. And finally, actively seek the sense of wholeness and home, the kind that is derived from the wholeness of the community. I said earlier that I think the beloved community will feel good, which is true, with the caveat that there still could be conflict and messiness. And while those things don't really feel good, the sense of wholeness that is the starting and ending point for that conflict in the beloved community absolutely does. So set out to find what that specific kind of wholeness feels like for you and then seek more of it. What else do we need to do to live into the beloved community? It's your turn to help answer that question. We can do this. The beloved community is right around the corner I look forward to experiencing it with you. May it be so. I'll invite you now to rise in body or in spirit for our closing hymn, number 1008, When Our Heart is in a Holy Place.
May we have the courage to live as if the beloved community were possible in our lifetimes. May we turn towards each other when it seems hopeless. May we together find wholeness we deserve. May we make it so. song 